There's these two questions at the beginning of every shoot. Who's the audience and what is the story you're trying to tell? Business of Architecture UK, episode 69. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am, of course, your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm in Blackfriars. I'm with Rob Fien. And I can, you know, every time Rob's on the show... It's always great. He's always got a wealth of expertise and knowledge. Rob Fien, of course, being the architectural PR maestro, uh, who's had a very accomplished career working at Fidon. He's worked at Roger Sturck Harbour and Partners, part of their in-house PR team. Uh, And then he was working for the PR agency Caro for a while. And he's recently set up, well, a few years ago now, he set up his own agency, Robert Fien PR. And, uh, With Rob this week as well, we were also joined by Jim Stevenson, who is an architectural photographer and filmmaker. You undoubtedly would have seen his work. He kind of is very prolific in the architectural industry. His work is incredibly beautiful. Um, And Jim was trained as an architectural uh, technologist. He's worked um, here and in the US, and he's been taking photographs for all sorts of architectural practices um you know he recently did photographs for Jenny Botsford's house in the garden in London which was amazing he's done pictures of David Adjay he's photographed invisible studios work just go and look at his website it's it's stunning stuff I know that he's this evening it's the Sterling Prize um so he's taking pictures there he's done pictures for Zaha um all sorts, all sorts, all sorts. So there was so much to talk about and um, we were kind of sitting and having a cup of coffee, figuring out how we were going to structure the conversation. And Rob, as always, the fountain of all good ideas, suggested why don't we take a sort of discussion and look at honesty in architectural photography and honesty and architectural image as a starting point for a conversation because there's so many different takes that we can kind of and angles that we can come on on this topic um i think it would be a really good way to start the conversation so that's exactly what we did and there was loads of goodies in this conversation and we talk about a lot of different uh topics regarding honesty about how um, architects like to have their photographs what actually works for getting published you know the kinds of images that magazines like to see um, and editorials like to see Um, so there's a lot of really really good content so sit back relax and enjoy myself Robert Fien and Jim Stevenson So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you were headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you here as always (laughs) Rob (laughs) Fine and Jim Stevenson architectural photographer yeah thanks for having us a pleasure so we're going to talk about honesty in photography right and I think this is a good conversation to have we've got a good sort of breadth of we've got all the areas covered here um so for you Rob what what is honesty in photography well I'm obviously trying to promote projects and practices so you want the imagery to align with uh, what you're trying to say. Uh, 
And uh, that means you need to get the right photographer who understands the brief from the architect, um, also understands how and the client uses a building. Um, and you kind of marry all of those things together so that you can accurately tell the press. Um, but for me, there is a, sometimes a worrying trend that people have something they want to promote, which isn't honest. So it's about mediating between the two of those. Like what? What do you mean? So sometimes... What's a dishonest agenda? A dishonest agenda is to say that, well, to say that a building has a function which it doesn't, or that in a, in a more everyday occurrence that a certain part of the building looks... Uh, in a way that it doesn't. So if you if you use photography to amend details, or um, you know uh, you know uh, fudge uh, something that's on the exterior that you don't like. Obviously, buildings have a, a role in public life. Mm. So that something like that can be quite easily spotted potentially. Well, what about in private clients' projects? I mean, that, that idea of amending photographs, for me as an architect, it's almost kind of like, oh, this is the, this is the one chance I get to amend <laughs> the thing that didn't come out the way that I wanted it to. And often, you know, I'll even walk around a building that I've done and I'm, I'm like, oh, I wish they hadn't put that there or they'd done this. Or, and then I think, oh, maybe we can sort it out in the, in the images. Is that dishonest or is it a kind of wanting to portray a particular image or an ideal and we're living in this world where we are you know, you know a lot of marketing imagery or you know the kind of cgi images or renders are so photorealistic nowadays that they're in almost indistinguishable from from photographs so there's this kind of culture anyway of being able to produce images of buildings which you know are the idealized I tell you what people will remember you longer for. It won't be that there was a fire alarm on the front of your building. It will be the time that you got caught where someone took a picture on their phone of your building mm. and posted it and said, oh, there's a fire alarm there. You must have photoshopped that. They'll remember the Photoshop job a lot longer than they'll remember you not doing it if you didn't do it in the first place. There's a balance, isn't there? Like For me, as a photographer, I, first of all, I think in a broader sense in photography, outside of the architectural world, it, photography is slightly hampered by the idea that the camera never lies that horrible term the camera never lies photography is evidence of something which it never has been it never ever has been not since Victorian era and it so but somehow we've we've sort of tied photography up in this idea that photography is evidence of something mm. and it isn't even if I take a picture of this room we're in now and we don't do anything to the photograph ever I've chosen to point a camera in a direction and I've not chosen to show the corner that's got a mess of wires and cables or something in it. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, so, so there's... There's always an editing process happening which yeah. is what we're choosing to show anyway. Even if you don't touch the pictures over, you're still... So the photographer and the architect's personalities are already embedded in the photograph in the first place. But then after that, I, for me, like, I draw the line at removing stuff that... If there's temporary things, you know, like... We were talking earlier, like if a dog's made a bit of a mess outside a building or if there's a, you've forgotten to move a fire extinguisher or hide it behind a plant pot or whatever, or it's like on the other side of a building and you haven't had time to walk around and get it. Like that sort of stuff I don't mind taking out. But if it's like a permanent feature that was just, you know, that I've, I've been asked to change the colour of render before mm. and I know that we've got it as is, but in the photograph, but the architect wanted it to be a different panto. I've been given Pantone references before to change to, and it's like that's that's that, that's that you're taking it to a next level there. You are basically just asking to do a render in that case. Mm. I think I think I think there's a certain degree where you have to accept that your building has a life of its own, and that is you know kind of you know a big. Uh, you know, mental leap. That's so like a letting go of a child. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and people talk about no. it. And people, and people talk about it all the time, that uh, architects need to let go. And I think, you know, photography is part of that. Um, and that you shouldn't feel scared to show a bit of, a bit of the guts of your, of your work. Mm. And uh, I think some, I think Jim would agree, that some younger architects are more happy with... Yeah, absolutely. Reality. Yeah, I think they definitely are. Like we, I'm getting, 
I work with a lot of those sort of newer practices, you know, those kind of, those sort of like people like Assemble and, and those kind of practices. We made that. And we t when I work with them and when we talk about the imagery, there's a level of kind of mess. I can't think of a better word, but a level of mess that we can put in an image. Mm. And and I quite like that idea. It's you're bordering more on sort of a documentary photography rather than a sometimes architectural photography can feel a bit like product photography, where the architecture is almost treated like mm. a sculptural element. Yeah. Whereas for me personally, and there are brilliant photographers who do that very sculptural work, like Hélène Benet does that be beautiful sort of tonal, lovely images. Um, they're very sort of um, clean and precise. But for me, I, I want my images to be a little bit more about the life that exists in the building, even if that life isn't necessarily exactly what the architect wanted. Or if it's, you know, if it's uh, a museum and there's a kid on the f who's got all their colouring pencils out and made a mess on the floor. Like that's more. That's that's as exciting to me as you know photographing this pristine picture of of the structure of the building. You know that that bit of life. I think it, and that and life. It's a bit cheesy, but that life is messy. Mm. You know. And from a PR perspective, I've had situations, certainly for larger projects, where an architect has employed two different photographers. One who's more um, artistically um, directed and will create absolutely beautiful images that you would frame and put on your wall, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when they've employed two photographers and the other one is more practical and functional and reveals a sort of more straightforward, nicely composed image of the, um, of the building and how it's used, those are the ones that the press tend to use because the, the sort of fictionalised view of a building is uh, the press are very adept at spotting that and saying that this is a sort of a, a, a second tier version of the building, a sort of seen through a creative lens. And that's, that's not very handy for their readers, um, to be honest with you. So they're, most of the people who are reading about building just want to see the building and how it works. Do you think sometimes that's down to a little bit down to fashion at the moment like I think the work the kind of work that I do at the moment I might be just my natural pass pessimistic nature um, but I kind of think my the imagery that I do is kind of a, in vogue at the moment like that kind of slightly messier stuff but um, there's some photographers that are coming through now like um, I'm sorry if I ruin the pronunciation but Simone Bose Bossy's work mm. that's really clean and, and all, some of the work that they're doing is almost like a render, like very, very close, mm. but is hugely popular right now. And I wonder if if we're just in a point at, at the moment where people like, you know, like Ewan Barnes started off that sort of documentary photography mm. thing and then there's, there's a few of us doing it. I wonder if the bottom's just going to drop out of what I do any minute and uh, it will go back to that more kind of um, sculptural style. Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so in the sense... I think there will be certain publications that like the sculptural yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's usually when they're commissioning something more as an art piece, an art article, yeah. um, which does happen. There's obviously there's this crossover between art and architecture, and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, if you go back through the history of architectural photography, there is an integrity, I think, in it. And, uh, you know, there, was, there, were even, there were even arguments that were made as in, within my career where people said black and white photography is in a way more honest because you haven't toyed with the colours, you haven't you haven't had post production, you haven't had you haven't had to go through the light effects of a cloudy day versus a sunny day versus a you know um, a, you know a sort of end of day light. You know they say black and white shows the form and structure, and there's no arguing. Well, um, <laughs> I would no disrespect to you that who you've had that discussion with, but that's just. Can I, am I allowed to swear? I'll yeah. say nonsense, shall yeah. I? In, I mean, like, the light it doesn't... Black and white is beautiful. It's showing tones and, and shadow. And that shadow, those shadow and tones are entirely um, dictated by the light. So, like, the, a black and white picture of the same wall will look different at 9am at midday and at, at 8pm or something like that. It will change completely. I, that discussion around black and white and colour is not that specific discussion, but the broader discussion in photography is just like mind bending. And, and you sort at some time, some point you just want to like get everyone who's talking about that together and just say, can we all just agree that this is nonsense? Yeah. <laughs> like sometimes black and white is beautiful and, and is perfect for the subject matter. If you've got loads of texture 
that you want to bring out or if you've got like uh like a nice overcast day where the lights like you've got that i know most architects want like bright sunshine but if you've got an interior on an overcast day and you've got that lovely soft light coming through get that with black and white you get like lovely tones like we we're talking about Ellen Benet's work already but like her work in her black and white work is perfect it's so beautiful but but you know architectures no one actually a lot of architects design in black and white but you know like color is part of it you know no and i and i think there's a lot of people that argue that black and white photography is part of the problem with the sort of over fetishization of brutalism because it allows you to show something in a very graphic elegant way in photography whereas then you might go and visit the building and you think (laughs) on an overcast day you think bloody hell (laughs) <laughs> maybe my love of this uh, style of architecture is unfounded, you know. So, no, I tell you, I'm just saying that I think there's there's a there's a long history of integrity in architectural yeah, photography, yeah, but, but, for, even if it's misguided. But we, we, yeah. have, we have so many different uses for architectural photography. So, like, you're talking, yes. you know, on, on one hand, there's, there's photographs which are going to be consumed by a wider audience in a publication, and so you need to be able to tick the boxes for what the PRs, what the media companies, what the press is looking for. There's also your personal narrative. Like, you know, I think architects, that part of the fun as well is like being able to have pictures, like 6A did with Jürgen Teller's yeah, studio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's like, I don't know if that ever got published anywhere else, but it's, those, are, those are really interesting photographs. And it's, you know, it's totally relevant. Yeah, yeah. And also it's, there's something creative and fun about, distorting the truth and telling a narrative or communicating something you know where where's where's the line between you know being creative and or just you know you're telling your own story i think i think there's a problem in architecture with offering a professional service where you might use a distorted image to sell yourself to a client who then doesn't get that dream because it, it wasn't possible And that's a big problem, isn't it? So beyond PR, that's a massive problem if someone says, well, hang on a second, you told me this was the dream building I would get, and it's not. Mm. And and the architecture, what does the architect then say? Well, don't worry, we'll sort that in post-production on the photography. (laughs) That's not very helpful. So I think, yeah, I think the lines are blurred. You know, I don't know, I don't think you can separate it clearly. But there is, there is an issue. Well, 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 it's interesting because there is, you know, with every marketing engagement or piece of marketing, there's always this ethical dilemma, whether it's in copy or writing, photography, of like you're selling and saying something. And if you cannot deliver what you're selling or saying, it's dishonest. And you're going to have problems and it's going to affect ultimately your, you know, your, 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 your business long term. Mm. It, like it won't, it won't continue. Mm. And then there's also the the want or the need to use photography as another creative medium to express something. So I don't know what you think about when you've seen, who was it a while back was doing kind of staged uh, activities in one of the houses they designed. And Someone they, did it not the day after a party. Yes, they did. They actually had like all the, the beer and the fags. All I mean, that's place. kind of like... Just really quickly going back to the Jürgen Teller stuff. I think he took those pictures. Yeah. I think that was him. And that it's perfect there's no although if you go into his studio you're probably not going to find him naked on, <laughs> was it on a horse or a donkey or something yeah, pretty, no. but actually knowing him you, you might, might yeah. like, you might walk in there when when i shot it he wasn't there so we had but there was inflatable dinosaurs all over the place and there was like it was a, war, a world cup it was during the world cup there's a world cup wall chart on because he was he was using his um studio to f- screen it to his mates and stuff so we like had the inflatable dinosaurs in the pictures and stuff like that and so it, it fitted like, him photographing it how he would photograph in that studio fits perfectly yeah. you couldn't do that like w- if if he got commissioned off the back of that to go and photograph I'm going, oh, what am I doing next? I'm going up to McAllen's to do the Rogers <laughs> distillery. Like, you're not gonna, he's not going to take a horse up there and take his clothes off and ride through. I'd like to see that. Very much. Uh, we would. <laughs> we would. Um, but, you know, it fits perfectly with that. But with, um, the, yeah, the staging stuff is, if you look, like, Julius Shulman is, like, probably, like, the godfather of architectural photography, mm. or certainly in the, you know, since mm. the sort of 50s. Um all that stuff's staged, you know, there's all these stories about like all the people wearing sort of cocktail dresses and suits that are sitting in his, in those beautiful case study houses in LA or Arizona and places like that or California. Um, 
that's all staged. Like none of those people. There. There's all this stuff about when he used to work with Richard Neutra, he would, Schumann would turn up with a van of his own furniture mm. and unload it into the house, and and Neutra would hate that. He would like they'd constantly be pushing furniture out and pushing it back in again. Mm. And I think that those pictures, the the one, the sort of I can't remember who did them, but the after party pictures it was about five years ago, I think in Dazine ran them. Um, I, the execution wasn't really to my taste personally, but I like the ambition of it. I like that they were. It was a, it was a house, quite likely to have a house party, housewarming party. I don't think it worked. It, it was just not. There was something quite slightly missing from it. But I sort of like the idea of it. You know, I like that someone was trying to do something a bit different rather than photographing a house. Mm. You know, all clean and clear with no people in and yeah, stuff like that. I could sort of. I quite enjoy a bit of like having a bit of fun with it. It can be theater. so serious. A bit of theatre. I mean, because yeah. it, it's interesting when when we, when we look at say other products like perfume is one that springs to mind because the perfume retail industry and the marketing that surrounds perfume is so bizarre, yeah. right? It is. I mean, you are paying money for like a little smelly liquid basically, and most of us <laughs> don't have the olfactory skills to be able to distinguish between even one aftershave from another, really, let alone know that this is a particularly good smell. But the marketing of around it is surreal and completely fantasy. Mm. And yeah, it's yeah. designed to sell you into like a, you know, it's all based on sex, it's all based on desire, it's all based yeah. on a lifestyle as well. It's a prestigious type of thing. Now, that's totally dishonest in a way. Yeah. It's a total fiction. Yeah. Yeah. But it's kind of like it works. And you kind of know as a consumer, like part of you knows logically that it's nonsense. You're not going to have, uh, you know, one of these beautiful models swooning over you. by. But emotionally, you're kind of hooked into that narrative. So where do we draw the line with that? With, with, we know. There's, and there's also, there's a, again, it's this creative element. Like as architects, one, we want to tell the story of our buildings and there's going to be a story around them. Hmm. And you do want your clients to be... They want to. They want to buy into the experience of of the building, of the narrative, of your practice, of that. And as long as you can be able to deliver on that, then mm. where where is the line? Oh, I think I think there's a balance between what I would call function versus fantasy. Mm. So, in a sense, in in the broad terms, reality of things, most architecture gets published in design titles, right? So if you have really grim furniture in a beautiful house, you're not going to get published. So that's a sad fact of life. So that's where function comes in to say, maybe we swap around the furniture or take the furniture out. Yeah. Because we know that if we want to, if we want anyone to look at this building who doesn't occupy it, this is a, we have to do this. And then to another degree, um, people often like to see some sense of scale in a building, right? Mm. So if you have a person walking through it, whether it's the architect or the photographer or just someone who's actually there, great, um, then that's really useful. That serves a function. But if it's a beautiful model and it's the she is distracting or he is distracting from what's going on with the design, you're starting to sell fantasy. And I personally would start to question that. I don't know. There are some photographers who... I, I always try to have people in my work mm. because I, I just think it, not just for scale, but also for purpose and curiosity and depth and all low, hundreds of different reasons. And per, also because they're there like, and they're, they're in the space. It's difficult with private homes, more difficult because it's someone's home and the homeowner might not want to be in the picture, yeah. uh, which is fair enough. I never force someone to be in a photograph. And then, it, and then who do you put in their place? And that's where that comes into. And, and, yeah, there is. I've there is some photographers who are using. You're looking at thinking like you're using the similar person in each shot, and it becomes like those renders that you get that is it looks like these sort of, um, these sort of beautiful island that is just full of incredibly attractive people, and but it's like a not that Walthamstow isn't full of incredibly attractive people, but it's a housing block in Walthamstow that actually might be considerably more diverse than the renders use, and the and photography there is a I, there are and Shulman used to do it but some photographers do bring in people to be in shots who perhaps don't live in that home and and 
yeah, and then when it when it when does it become an advertising shot? Because that's also the difference. I my yeah, okay, yeah. architecture photography isn't advertising photography. Right. It's editorial photography. Yes. So my work is editorial, it's it's news, it's not pure news, it's not I'm not a photojournalist, I'm not turning up because a news story has just happened. Mm. It's a much slower process than that. But it is editorial, it's not advertising. We're not my the primary focus of my work is to document the space as a as a what essentially will become a historical document yeah hopefully it's not to sell the building so we you know i'm not a real estate photographer i'm not trying to sell the home or the office block or the yeah. gallery space i'm my purpose is to document it and i, I think also i think that's that, a really good i think that's yeah, a really that, good that's point a, that's a very important distinction to yeah. make because what i was the references i was using there is uh, from the perfect that's that's advertising yeah, photography yeah. where you you do have the liberty i suppose to be able to go into that world of fan- fantasy whereas if it's editorial photography this is documentation it's but, reporting you yeah. know there are, there are many practices out there and there's I'm not making a value judgement there are many practices out there who do want to sell their architecture as a product because that's the kind of clients they work for yeah. so mm-hmm. they will put in uh, an attractive person or a sort of unrealistic setting into a room or, or outside a building and they'll say if you buy our services, this is the dream that yeah, you're buying yeah. into. And that's fine. But I think... No, but I think particularly for sort of luxury, high-end... Yeah, exactly. ...housing. I mean, there's that, there's a whole industry in that of, like, staging and, you know, the architects, you know, like on number one in Hyde Park or the Neobank side, there's, yeah, there's yeah. often different interior designers that are employed for different demographics of the market mm. and also for the own architects' own catalogue of imagery as well but I think what you have to be aware of as an architect is about dual purpose mm. so if you take those lifestyle images and then you you want them to be sent to the Guardian absolutely <laughs> no way are they going to run it because they're saying well hang on a second you know speak to our advertising department you know you mm. we're not going to publish that image because it's a lifestyle um, uh, agenda and that's that's not what this article is about. So I think that's what you just need to be aware of. Right. What is what is the purpose of the photograph? And if it is to if it is to get people to look at the building in a serious way, then I I would argue it needs to have some inte- the image needs to have some integrity. I also think people are quite for the most part, like you said, like most of my work is going into design press usually. And if it's not, then it might be going into like a Sunday supplement that is like a homes supplement. But most of my images are being looked at from quite visually literate people. Like they're, they're you know, it's, they're on, like they're in the AJ, so they're, they're being looked at by people who are trained in architecture. And if you, and so they're looking at it for that reason. You're not flicking through, um, you know, Mark magazine to look for a perfume advert you know you're looking through that because you want to read about architecture and I think in that setting and even in broader settings actually actually broadly through society I think we're becoming increasingly cynical of those very glossy Mm. we see like the um, Instagram influencers are now plummeting their 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 outreach is plummeting they're losing followers at a rate of knots they're having to do controversial things to maintain their their you know their popularity or mm. well, not popularity but their infamy um i guess but um uh people are quite cynical now about that sort of stuff or at least t- switched on to it and I, I shouldn't have said visually literate earlier actually because it's it's just everybody we all are now and i think if you present that very glossy um advertising type of image a lot of people get switched off by that and mm. and there's, there's only a small i think maybe with the higher end like you said the higher end residential stuff it may be suited for but a lot it switches a lot of people off and and it switches a lot of people who are in charge of putting these photographs out there it, 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 it is very interesting when I've, when I've worked for practices you know doing affordable housing schemes and then you know and the architects gone and done their own set of photography and then when the marketing companies come along and now they're trying to sell these houses it's like something totally different and it's a yeah. totally different market and the, the pictures are totally different. and this again it goes into that kind of world of of lifestyle, and I think it is, yeah, it is important for architects to understand the distinction of where and what the context is through which the pictures are going to be consumed. And when it's like a direct sort of sale or 
direct piece of advertising. It's a very different yeah, yeah. piece of content that's required. Also, you mentioned honesty and truth. I mean, the truth of a building is a very architectural concept. And so the, the fear, one of the fears that I have is going the other way. So going sort of anti-consumer uh, advertising and having a raw, empty space. Right, which the architect says, this is the truth, this is what I did. And uh, fair enough, they're saying, you know, don't put in furniture, don't put in people, because I didn't design the furniture, all the people, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. here is a raw <laughs> space, it shows my work, totally honest, take it or leave it. Now the problem is most people will leave it, because buildings are used, not hopefully, and so if you offer an empty space, in a, in a way you're signalling to the viewer, this building is not used it's a failure, mm. you so know. I think that point of view, though, you know, an architect, if an architect considers that to be the most honest representation of the building, I, God, I'm, this podcast is going to lose me clients. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're kind of, they're putting, there's an ego that's going before um, an actual realisation of what's going on. Because mm. the most, they've designed that building for people to use. Like, sometimes you might just design an office fit out and you might just be responsible for that. But if you've got, say um, uh, I've, a museum say for instance and you've gone in and photographed it before it opens that is it exists to show to have people in it and to to interact with it and to show exhibits and if you don't want to have that and I get people I get clients sometimes say to me oh we want you to go in before you know the public come in and mess it up and I'm like and I do my job, so I go and do it, and I do it to the best of my ability. But there's a part of me that's like, if you think the public are going to mess up your building by doing what they do uh, with their everyday life, then you need to check yourself a little bit. Like that, yeah. That's part of the life of your building. You don't. It has a life that goes beyond the drawing board. But I, I don't. I don't well, think you need to worry about ego so much well, as, well, as, well, as as misconceptions. Yeah. So I think as right, for my yeah. for my job, I see it as, as partly educational. Right. So. So bless them. Some of these architects think they're doing the right thing. So it's, it's not kind of like people will mess up my building. It's just like uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show what I've done and I hope people like yeah. to see it. And I have to sort of break the news to them that, you know, people want to publish, uh, you know, fit, fully fitted out offices with companies in them. Mm. And, uh, if, and I say this time and time again, if you send an empty image of an office floor plate with nothing in it, I cannot get it published. Really. Mm. I mean, maybe in a, a magazine which is promoting uh, aluminium, <laughs> you know, panels, <laughs> they might be interested to see how that's revealed. Cleanum technology. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, honestly, I think, you know, if someone is, right, want, is interested in design and office workspaces, then... That it needs to have a, 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 an office in there, a studio, uh, whatever. We keep talking about offices because that that is where, although I, what I just said about the mis architect's misconception of their buildings, they are the most difficult buildings to photograph for me. Yeah. Like if I get an office block, it is difficult to photograph them because the people, the end users, the people who work in the office do bring in mm. a lot of stuff and there's always boxes piled up everywhere. Mm. So to a certain extent, I can kind of, Just I do understand nice. it. Yeah. Birthday cards. Stuff, always stuff against, if there's not enough solar shading, always stuff against the floor to ceiling windows that the architect thinks are going to be great. But, you know, there. where do I, like I, I move a lot of stuff around. I move like again, like I, like I said before. If there's something that's temporary, mm. I don't mind moving. I physically move it out well, of the picture. I, I want to see the architectural render of a glass office tower which has the back of photocopiers <laughs> pushed up against windows. Yeah. <laughs> that would be true honesty, wouldn't it? That Someone's would be like, gym kit, and that would be like someone saying, "Don't worry, we've thought about this and we're designing the building." And what's what maybe one positive about a glass tower block is that you can see the life of the building. Yeah, yeah. You can see how people are using it, mm. which is a really interesting prospect. But the fact is they never do that, do they? It's always blue reflected well, it, glass. It, it, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, when you're working on a project architecturally, like it's difficult to imagine. I mean, you, you know, well, your job is to imagine how people are going to use it, but the way that you imagine how people are going to use it is very idealised. 
Like, you know, it's just yeah. so difficult to realise the complexity of human behaviour and that people do crazy stuff and stick stuff all over the place and do things. that People just do what they do. It's just life. But when we're designing it, you've got this kind of... And also, I think, like, as architects, you're conditioned in a way or you're kind of immersed in a culture of visual information about buildings, which is very, very controlled. And also, you're learning to talk about the control of images in order to sell architectural concepts and ideas. So when it comes to photography, the sort of the reality of life and how a building is used is kind of sometimes it's like, Whoa. but that's kind of exciting. And that's why we talk, you know, there's a lot of discussion around rendering renders at the moment being so like perfect. They, they look, so, I mean, some of them look like beautiful paintings, but they can also look like perfect photographs. Yeah. And, and then there's, you know, there's a conversation there want to do, where does does that start to threaten photographers? But that's where they're two different mediums and with mm. two distinct valid purposes. Because photography, we can do that. We can replicate renders and we can photograph the perfect setting and how the building was always imagined it would be used. But also we're getting the unexpected use. We're getting the, you know, we can go in and we can notice things that the, we might, the architect might not have predicted to be used. And those moments are actually beautiful like that's those so often not always sometimes like no. you know you'll the beautiful meeting room that they designed for the office block has just been turned into a storeroom or a server room but you know like sometimes those moments where we get away from um ex the building being used exactly how it's intended can be really 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 mm. uh beautiful and, and actually quite often the most successful images come from that kind of thing yeah the, the unexpected well, so it's like you're saying there, there is this process of like as an architect you've got to let go yeah. Let go and sort of allow the building to be lived in, and I that. think so. And yeah. Actually, there's a, there's a lot of beauty that can be celebrated, and it's actually very useful in terms of like marketing collateral. We shot a, a while back. We I was doing a film and photographs, or mainly a film, but I did photographs as well of of the Maxi by Zaha, mm. and um, I'd never been before until we did the recce. And we did our tour and, you know, you see all the bits you expect to see. You see, I've seen in the pictures, I think, I think Nick, uh, uh, Hafton and Crow have done some beautiful photographs yeah. of it. And I'd seen all of that stuff and it, it I was ex very excited. I thought, right, I mean, this is so photogenic. This is going to work really well. Um, but when we turned up in that, if you've been, there's like a courtyard outside it. There's, there's quite, the, in the summer gets filled with tables and, and there's a ca cafe and stuff like that. But it was kind of autumn when I was there. It was quite cold, but this kid's birthday party had taken it over and it was like all of these like maybe seven or eight-year-old kids running around all in fancy dress, like all like Marvel characters or like there was two girls on roller skates in flamingo dresses and there was a plastic, um, like really garish, like that you'd find in your garden, plastic kids' playhouse with a slide and stuff. And I just, that the pictures we got from that were by far the most successful images in, in terms of the video and the stills like one picture of this couple doing a selfie in front of the in front of the maxi and then behind them there's a little boy dressed as the incredible hulk who's jumping in and photobombing them and mm. and then the two flamingo uh roller skate uh girls go past and then in the foreground is this plastic hideous hideously beautiful plastic lumpy brightly colored house and I don't think that Zaha thought that that was going to be there. No. I'd, I think she, I'd like to think she'd have a sense of humour about it. Um, but I, those pictures ended up being the ones that were the most, that got the best reactions um, afterwards. And I think thinking about marketing rather than PR, how powerful is it to your future client to see a successful building or public space or, you know, or, or semi-public space operating with people, a picture of someone, people taking, who want to take selfies, including incorporating your architecture, is a <laughs> yeah. powerful selling tool in of itself, right? Because you're saying yeah. people will flock here and it will have an identifiable um, personality that people want to take pictures of. And, you know, developers and private clients know the value of that. Mm, yeah. You know, so if, so if you're saying people will come or, or that people will fill the office space because everyone wants to be in that building and it has, has been successfully leased out. That's great. So yeah. you've got to ask yourself, who are these empty pictures for? They're really for yourself, aren't they? Yeah. They're, and that's fine if you want to record that 
and show it to your team. Do both. Say, yeah, exactly. Do, Do both. both. And say, yeah, I think this is the thing that's kind of coming out is that it's knowing, you know, there's different, there's different types of photography for different contexts and for different consumers and for different audiences. And actually, I think as architects, it is... You know, there is something playful and creative to be able to do pictures which are for you and the way that you want them and they can be used how you want to use them, but don't expect them to be useful, particularly when you're going to the press or mm. for other types of, you know, editorial usage. Yeah, I think you can, you, you might show a client who you're working with and say, this is how we did this difficult corner and it's, this is a honest photographic evidence of that. Great. But um, again, if you send the same empty corner to Dazine, they're probably going to say this is not very useful. Well, I quite often get on bigger buildings, the architect will, I'll, you know, I'll meet them in the morning, they'll give me a tour and we'll talk about what areas need photographing and we'll talk about the key sort of areas. And we know these are the areas that are going to be the ones that can be put out there. But they're, uh, normally, nine times out of ten, it'll be right at the end they'll just open a door and they'll go, this is the plant room, could you just take a picture of it uh, yeah. for us? Because they need, like you said, they need to be able to show future clients that we can do plant rooms as well and they lay out really easily. We can, it's, that's more, that is more just proof we can do this. Or like, could you just do the toilets as well? Because like, we use some nice materials. Does he not gonna run uh, pictures of toilets or the AJ or the AR, you know, but, um, but they're useful to have. And I think there's, there's these two questions at the beginning of every shoot. Who's the audience and what is the story you're trying to tell? Yeah. There are these two questions at the beginning of your shoot. What is the story that you're trying to tell and who is the audience? And that story, there might be 10 different stories in the building and there might be 10 different audiences. Yeah. And you might yeah. use one photographer to tell all those stories. They might be able to do all of those stories and audiences in a day, or you might use 10 different photographers. And that's quite common with larger practices. They'll use three different photographers or four different photographers for the same project. And Alain Benet might go and do these tonally beautiful, rich, uh, stunning works of art. And then I might go in and do the messy, clumsy pictures of like people ruining the space. Um, that, but there, there's, I think that's the, the starting off point when I'm working with a new client is I ask those questions when, when do you typically get hired to take a photograph like at what point in the the building's life cycle is it kind of the tip i mean i, I generally i know a lot of architects they'll hire a photographer you know pre people moving in that's the sort of the classic yeah thing or do you have to go and visit buildings say just after it's been completed and then years down the line kind of do another shoot or is that i think Maybe it's because I don't know if this is the same for other photographers. It might just be because the, the, most of the work that people of mine that people see, like on my website or excuse me, in publications or it, on Instagram or whatever, it tends to be the buildings in use, mm. the buildings being populated. So most of the commissions I get are very shortly after it's open, so within right. a month of it opening. Um, so they can still use them because it's still news, it's still a new building, but it's still it's still looking nice and shiny and there, but there are people in there like that fine balance that and and I quite I like that you know that's perfect for me it means that the images can go out and get lots of news but there's still some sort of interaction but what's becoming more common I'm finding is that architects will get in touch during the construction phase and they'll want you know maybe four visits during construction mm. to track that and then a visit when it's finished and empty and then a visit when it's finished and there's people in it and then we'll talk about coming back in a year when the landscaping's bedded in or when the new exhibition is installed or something like that. So you end up having this relationship with the building that can last kind of a year potentially before PC and after PC. And I really love that because you feel like you're really mm. getting, you can really get into it rather than just turning up and doing it all in a yeah. day. I mean, that's budget dependent. Well, I, mean, I mean, Jim's raised an important point, which we should mention uh, to the listeners, is that... You might not have the budget to do 10 different shoots, different shoots yeah, yeah. book different photographers, whatever. So the best way to ensure that you get value for money is to go down to site with the photographer for part of or all of the day and do a proper, have the brief already in your head, talk about the photographer, which might change the brief slightly because they have bring their own ideas. And then you are very likely to be happy with what is delivered. Yeah. But more often uh, than I like, um, I will, architects will send down a photographer, they won't even go, and then they give them a very vague brief. And guess what? They don't like the photos they get back. And 
you know, they are dissatisfied. And whether they tell the photographer or not is problematic because if they don't even give them the feedback, then the photographer will never yeah. know. So I think, and sometimes I've had photographers, they then commission a second photographer and the first photographer contacts me and says, well, what, what happened? You know, yeah. I, they, I got all I got was the thumbs up and they paid my invoice. And then now I realise they're reshooting and I that's not the job I want to do. So I think, um, you know, for God's sake, try and properly engage with your photographer and you can you can influence the photos and uh, in a positive way. So f- yeah. From your perspective, what does that process look like? The ideal situation for me is that, say, let's assume it's a new client that I've been worked with for because that's the easiest to talk about. Um, the ideal situation is they'll get in touch with me a while before, maybe like a month or two. Like, there's not really, it's never really too early to start right. that discussion. And we'll talk, they'll send me over some floor plans and site plan. I can get an idea of our orientation and size. And then we'll talk about a few key shots. Mm. Some architects like to draw on a floor plan some arrows depicting like where they think key shots are. And then on the day of the shoot, we'll talk on the week running up to it about the weather and what, you know, they might want sunshine, they might want different weather conditions. On the day of the shoot, They'll turn up. We'll be we'll be there together in the morning. We'll do a tour. It might only last half an hour, just a really quick walk around. Um, I like it after that. Just I'll just crack on. Uh, sometimes the architect wants to stay, and that's great. We have some fun, and it's more of a collaboration. I'm quite happy just to crack on. The worst situation for that is the total opposite, where you get a new client who have basically been told by someone you need to get some pictures done, and they just send you. They say, "Oh, here's an address. Can you do this day? How much do you?" cost mm. and you don't hear from them and and I've had instances where I've been I've had I've pushed back on that and I've said look can you can we talk about this can you like 10 minutes on the phone can we just have a conversation because you go down there and you realize their disinterest in your process is it's kind of uh it's a red flag like are they actually involved in the building like it's when uh bands ask for a bowl of blue M&Ms they're only doing that because if you do a bowl of blue M&Ms, they know you've got everything else right when you turn up to that venue. If I get, if the client sends me over at least a set of floor plans, I know at least they're engaged in the photography and I, I, they're useful as well. But sometimes they turn up and the building's not ready. It's, it's like two weeks off being ready mm-hmm. to be photographed. But the architect hasn't gone down with, to site with you or hasn't made that phone call because the photography is just a thing to tick off their list. And... And then you you have to send the pictures back with a series of excuses, and that's like mm. the, that's my worst case scenario. Yeah. Sending images back and saying, "Look, I know you're not going to be happy with these, but these are the reasons why." Like, no one wants to do yeah. that. I want to send pictures, and I want them to. I did a shoot recently with the client of yours, Robin. We they were with me for the whole day. It was really good relationship. Like they were helping me. We sort of a good back, respectful back and forth, and then they looked at the images while we were waiting for dusk to come down. And one of them was just just said, oh, I f- like I feel I feel like I want to cry, like, and that's like the best. I want I want to know that they got what they wanted out of it, but um, yeah. So the, there's a re- there has to be. I don't like someone being on my shoulder and directing everything because that's just frustrating. But I want some sort of ideally, I want it to be a collaboration on some level, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it has happened to me where architects have said. Mm-hmm. Dear Rob, we're ready to go for press. Here are the photos I have taken myself Hmm. of my building. I know my building the best. I've got a hobby about taking photographs. And, you know, I've I've yet to have an experience where I say, oh, wow, what a surprise. (laughs) You, it turns out you are basically an architectural photographer in the making. Let's go to press. Yeah, Yeah. Because they're not good enough. Yeah. And uh, I've even had situations where I've sent out, I've been forced to send out architects photographs alongside professional photographs to the press to keep someone happy. And they don't use the amateur ones. They just don't. It just takes them, you say we're a very visually, visually literate uh, uh, society now. You don't need a, a picture editor to make those judgments. A journalist will look at them and say, well, can't yeah. use that. End of. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's great that loads of architects out there take photographs and they should keep doing that. But um, to use them professionally is dangerous. I've seen architects put them on their own website and their website might be designed nicely, might Mm -hmm. have a nice 
framing, but the photograph kills it, you know, and I think that's a problem for a lot of smaller practices. And I would say to them, invest in a photographer, you know, and there is a range, as Jim will agree, there's a range of photographers out there. Mm. It doesn't take much research. You know, Iwan Ban costs quite a lot, I think. I guess. But there are younger, more hungry photographers who are very talented, who are much more affordable. And I think your business should be able to handle that in the budget. And if you're running an architectural practice uh, and you can't afford professional photography um, at all, uh, that's uh, that would be a really scary, I mm. think. Well, a lot of those young practices as well live off, for, for those first few years, can live off awards and things like that, like the small projects mm. award and thing, and, and, you know, small, just to get their name up and running. And, um, and it's... You you can't go into awards with amateur photographs like the the, the people organising these awards are requesting professional photographs. Yeah. But I would also say that it's no photographer wants to feel like they're being haggled down or ripped off. But also, oh, certainly I don't, again I can't speak for all photographers here. But for me, if if a new client gets in touch and says that we don't have much of a budget here what can you do or we can do this like and and i look at their website and i realize they've just done a house extension and it's they've it's probably been a bit of a labor of love and they probably i know because i used to work in the industry i know that some of those projects that aren't earned turning much over i'll work i'll help i'll try and work with them with, with their mm. budget so i would always say ask the question if i look at your website and you're doing like million pound office blocks and stuff like that and you're trying to haggle me down to half my price i'm i'm not going to we're not going to entertain that as yeah. as much, but I think if you're a smaller practice and you're concerned about that budget thing, I'm not saying come to me and haggle with me, but <laughs> do. But also, like just any photographer, find the photographer that you think is going to represent you the best, and just uh, be honest. And if if you're open and honest about it, and and the photographer doesn't think that you're trying to, you know, pull pull the wool over a little bit, they they will hopefully be open to a bit of a discussion about mm. that. But but I would also say value the, the photographs as they yeah. are so important so it's not just for that one PR moment you're going to put it on your website you're going to use it for awards you're going to put it in brochures you know you're probably going to refer even to your first ever projects way down your career yeah. so the investment is big lifelong. for lifelong yeah. for a small amount of money relatively the vast majority of architectural photographers I've worked with not fashion or any of that stuff but architectural photographers are good value for money before you haggle down, I think. So, you know, I think accept accept that relationship and just move on. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I have to explain, I, you know, I do have to explain to some architects all of those things I just said. And then they tend to sort of relax a bit more and say, mm -hmm. all right, fair enough. It's a, it's a bigger picture understanding. And I, I, I know I've made, I've made the mistake, but I've tried to take photographs of buildings myself and then you come back and you're like, these are so bad. <laughs> it's really hard. It's really difficult. It's really I hard. I thought I could just do a bit of Photoshop magic. Or I've even employed photographers who aren't architectural photographers. They're good photographers, but they're maybe used to doing stock photography or more, more yeah. commercial portraits or things like that. And then they've gone in and taken photographs of a, of a house and then it's been like, oh, the lines aren't straight on the walls. I thought that was obvious. Yeah. Or they use like a sort of fisheye lens to capture yeah. the inside and you're like, I can't actually use any of these. And that's yeah. like the budget gone now. Um, and, and again, you forget how often you use your pictures. And also like as a collection of photographs, when you're particularly if you're doing things off your phone and you're sticking that on a website, when the overall visual imagery and out, you know, effect that it has is very discombobulated. It's it doesn't look good. Yeah. And it just doesn't it just doesn't sell anything. And sometimes you only get some buildings you can go back to, but sometimes you only get that one chance. So if you want to yeah. if you're doing a a book, if you get to twenty five years down the line and you're doing a book revisit like a monograph of your work and your you the first photographs you got you look at and you're cringing if that's of like a private house you probably can't get back into that now yeah like maybe if it's a gallery you might be able to but you know the in all likelihood the photographs are going to outlive the building mm. unless we have some sort of massive worldwide data loss incident but <laughs> the photographs are probably going to outlive your building so like just get it right jesus like to make sure you're investing something in it. And know? I mean, I'm always amazed at practices that say, 
where do I even begin, Rob? You know, can you give me some recommendations? And obviously, that's, I'm happy to do that. But at the same time, I'm thinking, if you Google Architectural Photographer London or Architectural Photographer UK, you immediately get a lot of relevant... Because there aren't, there aren't that... There aren't, isn't a huge industry. Mm. So you're going to get a lot of relevant people, um, big and small, and you click on their websites and you get a sense of their portfolio. I yeah. mean, it's not, we're not, talk- this could be a job that's done almost in front of the TV yeah. in the evening. So you don't have to worry just about losing. When you're browsing through design or whatever, just see, to see an image that you like. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, looking at your peers' websites and saying, my God, that's a lovely, crisp, clean image that, you know, is relevant to my architectural style. There's a photographer, look up their name. If they don't have a website, that's, that's on their that's on yeah. their part, isn't it? Yeah. So I think um, it yeah it doesn't take much, and then as we say that you will be grateful. In the and keep a list, I reckon, just get, because I I get sometimes I get architects get in touch with me and they say, oh, we've been following your work for a while. We'd really like you. We've got mm. we finally got the project that we want you to do because they might think, you know, because you also like some photographers are, are more suited to certain types of buildings than others. But yeah. so they might say to me, I'm doing a shoot tomorrow actually. That's for an architect who approached me in that way, which, because I, I'm, I, that, I mean, that's a little bit embarrassingly flattering. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Thank you very much. But it's a public building that we're doing tomorrow. It suits my kind of style. Um, and they, they've they been following my work for a long time, but they they waited until the, the right project came along rather than getting everything photographed by me, which is a different discussion really. But um I, and but the, which indicates that they've been keeping a list that they've see, seen photographs somewhere and they've just jotted my name down mm. and that list might be 10 strong they might have other photographers on there and they might finish an office block next week and contact someone else for that but um just keep a bit of a list and just and when you're looking at photographs try and consume them in a slightly more critical way i don't mean criticize the photographs but cr- just be think don't let them we, we, we complain that we get washed with images at the moment, but just don't let it then. Just pause. You're the one that's consuming them. Pause and look at the image and think, oh, why do I like that? Mm. What is it about that? What what was the photographer trying to do? Why has it caught my eye? And then just jot it down. And, you know, it, it might be a year or two before you contact that person, but just have that like, running in the back, like you said, in front of the telly or something like that. Also, I'd say if you're an architect and you post, uh, it's just a personal grind. <laughs> you put a photo of your building on Instagram credit the photographer yes, tag them I mean that really winds me up because it's like Instagram is confusing enough as it is because you're if you're posting an image vast most, vast majority of times people go you posted it there's no credit you must have taken it yeah. it's the general inference um, so I think if you post it and you really happy with it you should say you know thanks thank your photographer by tagging them and saying um you know a well done click click jim for for this great photograph um because that helps the industry as a whole do you know what i mean then people can yeah. easily track an image and you know and it just elevates us all and you know don't be so uh close and i know people don't do it always on purpose yeah, I think a lot of time it's just they forget it. But my DMs in Instagram are basically me just messaging my clients saying, I'm really pleased you've shared the image. Could you just add a credit, please? Because it's in my terms and conditions. Um, and I try and be friendly about it because it's, it's no point having a row about it. But like, come on, please just like stick a... And you get publications doing the same thing. Like, yeah. And just... just but it's always been, it's there. interesting, isn't it? In the press, it's always been a legal requirement. Yeah. Really to properly accredit images and what was happened because we're still in the sort of infancy of a social media age all the sort of uh, uh, the etiquette and the rules and regulations are getting very confusing and what's happening is it's having a reverse effect on the press now mm. where people who are raised in a social social media age are saying well will you just use images what's the value of you know who, why do I need yeah. to credit them and so it's kind of go, so we need I you know, we all need to keep an eye on that. Yeah, that kind of the share culture and not having something yeah. that leads back to where the original source is and it's I mean, critical. I don't want to be down on that. I love it. Like, I, th- like, I love seeing my images shared. Mm. And I know there's photographers who are much stricter and that's fair play. Like, they've got their own... It's this, I'm just talking about me personally. I want my images to be shared out there. Like, there's some photographers who will have in their T&Cs, you know, every time you use one of the images, you've got to 
there's another fee or there's a time expiration to it. Totally fair enough. Like that's the world they've grown up in, particularly like photographers who started off shooting film when you were getting more licensing agreements. For me, like I just I get paid a good amount. I earn a good living from visiting buildings, which is incredible. Um, and I want those pictures to be out there. I don't want them on a hard drive doing nothing. So share them. Do please do share them. When I'm DMing people saying you got to add a credit, I'm, I want them to be out there. But just for the sake of like, what is it? 10, 13 letters a credit for me. Like that takes a second. Like just make sure you're remembering to do that. And for all photographers. And likewise, if I post a picture of that I've taken of someone's work, I'll always put the architect in there as yeah. well. I'd say I do think as well, you know, I've worked with photographers, architectural photographers for years now, and mm-hmm. some of them need to sort of wake up and accept the realities of the situation. Because, you know, when in the past, we were in an age where a photographer would take an image, get paid by the client, and then get additional money for every time that image was used. Mm-hmm. We are not in that world anymore now. I've had major international publications say, we have no picture budget whatsoever, you know, or we can you know, we can stretch to a tiny sum of money, which is in, in its almost not worth the, <coughs> the effort spent in invoicing. We're not in that age anymore. So I think there are certain photographers who do need to wake up and say, this is the fee with the media rights. You know, you agree that, that money and then that's it. Because um, these additional licenses, you know, can kill a, a PR story now. So I have a great building, great photographs. Everyone's happy to go. And all the newspapers and magazines say, we're not paying any additional fee. And then that's it, it's dead. It yeah. doesn't get published. And that's so sad. And, it and then it just sits, sits, on a, sits on a hard drive, sits yeah, on the architect's exactly. website. And every few months we get a ping through someone saying, wow, what a great project. Can we publicise it? Yeah, if you want to pay the money, silence. I mean, there's some, there was a few magazines, a lot of the European magazines still pay. There's a couple of UK magazines that will still pay. It is like, compared to what it used to be, it's tiny fees. But, um, and that's wonderful. If I can get like, even if it's just like 50 quid because they've ran a cover or something. Mm. Like previously that would be hundreds of pounds for a cover. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I like that. And you get a cover of a magazine. I, and so I think there has to be some flexibility. Like ideally, I'd love to get paid every time my image is yeah. released. But it, that, that world isn't coming back. Yeah. Like, I can, it's kind of like music, isn't it? The kind of idea of royalties and yes. music. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it kind of, it, you can... You look at, like, on Spotify, you look at how much bands make when their songs get streamed. It's, like, pennies, less than pennies, fractions of pennies. And it's not fair, but it's not coming back. And it's so it's really difficult to find that balance and be realistic. I, for me, per, again, just for me personally, I just want my images to be shared. I want them to be credited, so it all comes back to me. But I've, I've decided a long time ago to really fully embrace all of that and just try and get my images out there. And then, and then I guess it also works the other way, going back to the architects and talking about value. If you're buying media licenses, you have to understand what it means to the photographer. Yeah. You know, so that's the other side of it, is saying, if people go, oh, that's a bit much just for taking a photograph. No, it's someone's livelihood and they've delivered something which is incredibly useful. So you, you should pay for that. And also the f- license, we go, we're going slightly off topic here, but the the license the photographer is giving you is for you to use them. It's not for the builder yes. and not for the lighting designer yes. and not for the furniture designer and yes. not for everyone else. They oh, all have to pay yes. on top of and that. I think, right. And I think that is a, re- I think it's a really good point to make. And because a, if you, a lot of architects have wised up to this, and I try and advise others, is that if you know in your mind, you say, right, we're going to shoot the building, but as we're setting up the contract with the photographer, we'll go to the contractor, we'll go to the client, yeah. we'll go to the lighting designer, blah, 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 and we'll say to all of them, hey, we're doing the shoot, do you want in? That's great. And that works out really well for everyone because they don't want to organise a photo shoot. They get the photos. They've paid probably not as much. Once and you start sharing licences, it's not going to be as much. Yeah, it? you don't pay the full amount every yeah. time. So everyone's getting a good deal. Photographer's getting a good deal. And... Um, also, you're controlling the quality... And all the consultants can use... Yeah, and you're controlling the, the quality of the images, because yeah. if you... So that's, well, that's probably something that a lot of people don't realise then, is that, you know, you're sharing the images amongst consultants and, you know, the engineers are going to use your pictures and stuff like that. Actually, they haven't got the licence to, to use it. But, but, you know, in so many... I've been in so many situations where an architect has done a fantastic building and then the air conditioning company has hired a photographer who's done a terrible job 
And then once those images are out there, they are out there. Yeah. So wouldn't it have been better for you to have, like, foreseen this happening and jumped in and said, hey, guys, you don't need to worry about doing that. I've done it. And we did, we briefed him to get the air conditioning unit from yeah. a certain angle and your quid's in and they'll be happy. They don't have to organise it. And it is yeah. the best, it is, it works out so, like, you can, you can really, like, the more, so I have a set rate, X amount for a day. And then if you want to add an, an extra licensee, so that's for the architect, if you want the builder to have a licence, it's a percentage of X amount. It's, yeah. a, it's not, you don't pay X again. So if you get gather five consultants together, you, you know, I'm getting paid more, brilliant, I'm getting paid like a decent, quite a decent, that can work out quite a very good sum of money for me. Yeah. But each individual person is paying much less than X amount. Yeah. You know, everyone's getting a cheaper shoot or a better value, no, they just get paying less cheaper suit shoot and they're getting a cheaper shoot i'm getting more money more people to share the images everyone's got the legal right to share the images yeah, so have wider wider distribution exactly yeah it's all works out it's well for all parties and if you're a smaller practice it, it makes the whole process much more affordable for you as well so yeah so you know better value for money uh image quality control you know, mm. happier photographer, happier client, triple, quadruple win, <laughs> and, and happier PR if anyone cares. <laughs> Brilliant. We I, care. I love it. That's that's been that's been fantastic. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Don't enjoy it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your fifteen minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.